the La Crosse Public Library Archives presents Dark La Crosse Stories, a series in collaboration with the La Crosse Tribune. Dark La Crosse is a suite of programs that feature the seedier side of La Crosse history and also include a downtown walking tour, a trolley tour, and an annual stage production with new content each year. In the 19th century, La Crosse relied heavily on the Mississippi River as its interstate transportation system. A significant portion of the nation's commercial and passenger traffic moved up and down inland rivers, a geographical area that spanned both slave and free states. Life and labor on the steamboats was grueling and dangerous. To navigate the rivers, steamboats had only a shallow hold where cargo was stored. The deck was used to stack more cargo and as the accommodation for the poorest passengers and the crew. Above this was the boiler deck, combining the main cabin and staterooms, and next was the hurricane deck to house officers, with the pilot house topping it off. The higher you worked from the water level, the more rewarding steamboat life could be. Since the steamboat companies strove to provide luxurious travel accommodations to their passengers, this created a niche market for some highly skilled and well-paid black workers, such as barbers and chefs. Barbers were not actually part of the crew, but rather rented out space and worked for themselves on steamboats. That was my job aboard this beautiful steamboat, the War Eagle. My name is Spiller, Felix Spiller, and I was the barber on this vessel, and a mighty fine vessel she was. A side wheel riverboat built in Fulton, Ohio, near my hometown of Cincinnati in 1854. She was 225 feet long and was powered by four high-pressure steam boilers. The War Eagle was painted a brilliant white and a golden eagle with wings spread was placed on top of the pilot house. Described as one of the finest boats in the Mississippi, she boasted onboard barber shops, washrooms, fine velvet carpets, and expensive furniture. For the passengers, of course. The War Eagle was originally built for the Minnesota Packet Company at a cost of $33,000. Did you know that she, along with six other steamboats, chugged her way up the Mississippi River on the Grand Excursion in 1854 from Rock Island, Illinois to St. Paul, Minnesota? It was an opportunity for the investors and the former president of the United States, Millard Fillmore, to see the possibilities the West held for the future of our country. Saturday, May 14, 1870 was a beautiful day. The War Eagle arrived at La Crosse right on time. She dropped off passengers at the city landing at State and Front Streets in the afternoon and then proceeded north to the railroad depot on the Black River to take on freight and await the midnight train from Milwaukee. Some passengers departed having reached their destination and others got off at the main landing to take dinner in town or visit with others before reboarding at the railroad depot at the mouth of the Black River. Some remained on board. That's when I met Mary. While we were docked, a well-to-do German man named John Ulrich approached me. He was the editor and publisher of the German language newspaper here in La Crosse called the Nord Stern, or North Star in English. With him was a young woman whom he introduced as his niece, Mary. Mary was 18 years old and was to travel up the river to Alma to attend her sister's wedding. But women, especially young single women from respectable families, don't just travel alone. Mr. Ulrich asked me to see to it that Mary arrived safely at Alma. After thinking it over a moment, I agreed. Mr. Ulrich left, and Mary boarded to await departure. When the midnight train arrived, 
passengers and freight were transferred to the War Eagle for transport to St. Paul. Among the items loaded were wooden barrels filled with Danforth's non-explosive petroleum fluid, a kind of lamp oil. While loading the barrels onto the War Eagle around 11.45 p.m., the foreman reported to Captain Thomas Cushing that one of the barrels was leaking. The captain ordered the boat's carpenter, William Bennett, to fix it and several others that were leaking. The night watchman held the lantern for Bennett, but was called away before Bennett could finish. According to Bennett's testimony, his lantern exploded, caught fire, and burst during the repair. Soon the barrel was ablaze, as well as the ship's carpenter. He jumped into the water to extinguish the fire from his clothes and survived. The barrel was rolled off the left side of the boat, but a barge lay alongside, preventing the crew from rolling it into the water. While not explosive, the lamp oil turned out to be quite flammable. Fire and thick, heavy black smoke rapidly spread through the wooden boat. The fire alarm was sounded, and the officers ran through the boat trying to awaken passengers. Those passengers who were still awake and dressed left the boat via the gangway to safety. Others on board were asleep and in their cabins faced bigger challenges. The jolly boat was lured into the water, but not all the people could fit into it. Through thick black smoke, Mary Ulrich made her way from stateroom A on the starboard side of the rail on the second deck. The staircase was cut off with thick smoke. She moved toward the aft of the boat, behind the housing, over the paddle wheel on the starboard side. The War Eagle was still docked, and Mary was not farther than 25 feet from shore, but deep water prevented her escape as she could not swim. Fighting through thick smoke, I found her in the raging inferno. The flames rose higher, the smoke became thicker, and Mary became hysterical. I had made a promise earlier in the afternoon, and I was not going to die a coward. Some boats that were moored alongside were able to be set loose and managed to escape the fire. However, the War Eagle was totally consumed and the fire spread to the dock, the warehouses on shore, the railroad depot, the train cars from Milwaukee, and to the very large grain elevator just down the dock. All were destroyed in an hour's time. It was estimated that damage totaled $250,000 or over $4 million in today's money. Only five people are documented to have lost their lives in the fire. Whether they jumped into the Black River together or if Felix jumped in after Mary to save her, neither survived the leap into the deep, dark, cold water. According to witness reports years later, Felix and Mary's bodies were found together. Felix Spiller died a hero, but was never recognized for his efforts. His body was conveyed to the coroner and was buried in an unmarked grave at Oak Grove Cemetery in the Potter's Field section. Mary's body, on the other hand, was transported to her uncle's residence, and a large funeral procession of her friends accompanied her remains to the same cemetery in a respectable family plot. Mary was eulogized as an accomplished young woman. And now I'd like to welcome in Anita Taylor Doring, Senior Archivist and the Archives Department Manager at the La Crosse Public Library, who did some of the initial research for this story. While all steamboat workers were susceptible to disease and violence, deckhands and roustabouts who were largely African American were also likely to be crushed by cargo, knocked overboard into the swirling river or frostbitten. For such dangers, they received slightly higher pay than some of their fellow black cabin workers. Cabin workers were less likely to have a cotton bale fall on them while eating their lunch, but they did have to deal with white passengers on a constant basis, providing plenty of opportunities for casual violence. 
Balancing out the abuse from passengers were the tips cabin workers received, which could often amount to several dollars per voyage, the difference between the workers' meager base wages and a living wage. Barbers, like Felix Spiller, were basically business owners who rented out space on the riverboats. Like most of the country at this time, African Americans controlled the barbering trade in La Crosse, at least until 1910, by which time the local black population had dwindled. Barbering had a particular appeal for African Americans, regardless of the area into which they moved. During pre-Civil War days, urban centers in the South were dependent on the free African American barbers. Barbering was a difficult service job that required a good mind for business, as well as the craftsmanship of barbering, and did not take much capital to set up a shop. Young men and women only needed to serve an apprenticeship before heading out on their own. Shops owned by black men and sometimes women were especially held to high standards because in most cases they were expected only to service white clientele. On top of that, there were also white owned barber shops serving only white clientele. On this subject, I'm in debt to Professor Bruce Mauser of the University of Wisconsin La Crosse for his research data from census, city directories, newspapers, and other sources on the history of black Americans in La Crosse from 1850 to 1906 which Mauser published and is available online. In his findings, he states that the first African-American to come to the fledgling town of La Crosse was in 1852, John Williams, who was a barber. Williams used income from his barbering trade to also buy land and was a landlord earning income from rentals on his property. He also did a lot of land speculation in the Winona, Minnesota area. It is likely that Williams, a Pennsylvania native, arrived in La Crosse by way of steamboat coming west on the Ohio River, then connecting to the Mississippi River and heading north. Mauser counted 36 African Americans living in La Crosse before the outbreak of the Civil War. A frontier town, La Crosse grew rapidly after 1855 and so did the number of barbers. Between 1855 and 1861, seven new black barbers joined the scene, including John Burney. Like Williams, Burney invested in property. He purchased a number of empty lots to construct houses and resell the properties. By looking through city directories and newspaper articles, both found in the La Crosse Public Library Archives collections, you can easily track down the properties Bernie owned, developed, and sold. You can also trace the many downtown buildings in which he conducted his business. Though the Bernie family left La Crosse in 1884 and moved back to Louisville, John Bernie's impact on the city was notable. Besides his wealth, he was popular in town. According to a few sources, he was a founding member of the Old Settlers Association of La Crosse, which was a group devoted to celebrating the town's founding and founders. This group later threw Bernie a going away party and presented him with $125 and a gold watch as a parting gift. The La Crosse Public Library Archives is fortunate to have several photographs of the Bernie family, thanks to a descendant of another La Crosse family who donated photographs from their collection. It is likely that this family were friends with the Bernies and may have had social, religious, and or business dealings with each other on a regular basis. You can check out resources that we have on our website if you're interested in learning more about the Bernie family, Dr. Mauser, or general local black history. In the 151 years since the sinking of the War Eagle, the wreckage has continually fascinated the people of La Crosse, some even able to wait out during periods of low water and search for souvenirs from the site. Later, organized dive teams and individuals searched the Black River for artifacts. In 1988, the La Crosse City Council passed an ordinance protecting sunken vessels such as the War Eagle, but many recovered artifacts of the War Eagle from diver Dennis Brandt are on display at the Heritage Center of the La Crosse County Historical Society. Much of the information regarding John Ulrich, Felix Spiller, and Mary Ulrich featured in this story was reported in the local newspaper many years later by Charles Giselle, who was nine years old at the time of the incident. While the burning and eventual sinking of the War Eagle is one of La Crosse's most notable disasters, these details evoke the universal human emotions of self-preservation, fear, dignity, loss, and grief, which are clearly evident in this tragic affair. Thanks for listening.